Hi all, let's continue our look at the evolution of chess style and have a look at the amazing game between Vasily Smyslov playing white against Mikhail Botvinnik in the USSR Absolute Chess Championship of 1941. So Smyslov, of course, was to become a fierce challenger to Mikhail Botvinnik after he had become world champion. And later, Botvinnik managed to wrestle back uh, the champion's title from Smyslov. It was only later that Botvinnik succumbed eventually to Tigran Petrosian. But uh, this was like the prelude more than 10 years earlier to those world championship battles. So e4 from Smyslov, e5, knight f3, knight c6, we have a classic Roy Lopez, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, and now white plays d3, which does actually threaten bishop takes c6 and knight takes e5. The e pawn has been protected here. Uh, black can choose uh, between bishop c5 or protecting uh, the d the, the e pawn with d6. Uh, those are two very very common moves. Uh, also b5 is actually uh, possible here just to kick the bishop first. Um, but uh, okay, d6 is chosen. We have c3, bishop e7. And both sides castle. Rook e1. Now b5 here. Bishop c2. Bishop going back. So it looks as though White's plan in general might be to try and play on these light squares later. Maneuver a knight. This is quite a common idea. Maybe even to e3. And hit on these two squares later. Uh, this latent potential also with d4. Maybe this bishop's going to be dangerous on the diagonal if the center opens up later. But we have here black actually trying to fix down this c2 bishop. This is very, very interesting because uh, there's a, actually a slight weakness potentially that emerges after this next move from black, which looks very, very aggressive and is actually offering, um, you know, taking here puts pressure on e5. So maybe queen takes d5 is needed actually to protect e5 but uh, white doesn't want to go in for that he wants to keep his structure pretty solid he doesn't want frontal pressure on d3 for example later that would actually be a backward pawn then he just plays knight bd2 so a lot of latent like stored energy here creating that strong point the e4 square black actually took on e4 and after d takes Yes, there's only one shared file here, and it seems a potential outpost square for black would be d3. If you look at d3 here, it's a bit more sensitive than, say, d6, because actually, well, a pawn covers d6 here. But uh, on the other hand, white has a pawn here guarding d4, so d5 is actually more sensitive for black. If you look at the sensitivity of squares for potential outposts, so f5 and d5 for white. Uh, in this particular structure. Mind you, the c pawn can later come to c6 to evict that. But d3 for black here looks like a potential outpost square. Bishop e6 is played here. And now, if the nuisance knight g4 can be replied with bishop g4, so we see here h3, which means that knight g5 is possible without bishop g4. Slight weakening of the dark squares though. If a knight ever came to f4 later, then this is a bit more of a problem. g3 might be less possible with that h3. But anyway, now black also mirrors that with h6. And now we have knight h2. Now knight h2 for white means that the queen can actually glide in for an attacking position potentially. And maybe supported later with say this knight coming say to f5 and the bishop looking at h6 black mirrors this move with knight h7 but it carries a bit more implication here the bishop here is interestingly contrasted with the bishop here black by playing knight h7 mirroring botvinnik's move sorry mirroring smyslov's move botvinnik is playing knight h7 means that the the trade of the dark square bishops might weaken white on the dark squares potentially that might be a possible idea but interestingly, there's, there's a little twist on that even if 
the dark square bishops don't get exchanged. So it's a very, very interesting mirroring and the implications are extremely interesting here. Why it actually plays knight g4, that's another idea of knight h2, just to get a very, very aggressive looking knight here. Black plays bishop g5 here, so he's willing to ex exchange maybe the dark square bishops to weaken white on the dark squares. Queen e2. And here we see queen d6. So it looks as though, yes, e5 is supported a bit more. Maybe black's going to potentially uh, put more pressure down the d file. And if it's, it seems if the knight moves, then maybe there's also bishop c4 harassing the white queen here. Bishop c4 might be an interesting resource if this knight moves away from covering uh, the c4 square. White actually plays knight e3. So now these f5 and d5 squares are under a bit more scrutiny. If white puts more pressure on the light squares, this maybe is getting a bit more of a concern as well with queen f3 later. Rook fd8, putting more pressure down that d file. Now a very interesting transaction here, knight f3. Does the bishop want to move back in this position? On the other hand, the knight's not guarding c4, it's only this one now. And in fact, there's a strategic benefit from getting a bishop to c4. Potentially, this bishop could exchange off for this one, making this outpost square more of a realistic proposal. The outpost square, if something lands on this outpost square, it can't be kicked by a pawn. So it is potentially a valuable outpost for black. And in fact here, instead of retreating the bishop, interestingly, Mikhail Botvinnik decided to give up the bishop here for that knight. It does a few things, not just making way for this kind of maneuver to celebrate the outpost square, but also it means that there's less scrutiny on, on d5 and f5. White's light square campaign is slowed down and black's light square campaign is actually accelerated. But on the other hand, isn't this bishop going to be dangerous? So let's see what happens now. Queen takes e3. Queen e7, the queen actually steps back here. And now we have knight h2, maybe queen g3, an attacking move, stuff like this. Now knight f8 is played, queen f3. And black actually has a facility that white doesn't so much, much here down this default, black can actually have the luxury of doubling rooks. It looks as though there's no entry point, so you know why do this? Well, it's this outpost as well, square though. If it can be weakened, then this is you know a potential entry point into white's position, if these bishops can be exchanged off later. And you might think, well, couldn't, couldn't white like cover this? Well, maybe then b4, and then d4 is weakened if this pawn moves. So we see knight f1, knight h7, Knight g3, so white's continuing his light square campaign. Rook ad8. So at the moment, it seems there's no benefit of this with no entry points at the moment. Knight f5, and black can tactically play this next move, facilitated by the knight on h7. There's no knight takes h6. You know, with the knight protecting the queen, the queen's not dropping off the queen takes f6. So this is possible to do this. So black stares down that uh, d file here. And we see g4, potentially weakening move on the dark squares, if it's not going to break open uh, black's position. But it's a little bit scary to face. Knight e7, giving the option for maybe taking or coming here. Queen g3. And now we see this outpost campaign, bishop c4, coming into d3. Is black getting the upper hand here through that central file? We see f3, it looks another weakening, potentially uh, weakening move on the dark squares now. Bishop d3, black is establishing an outpost. Bishop b3, c5, pardon me, c5, and it's gonna be protected by the pawn soon. Bishop e3, c4, bishop goes back. So black seems to stand very, very comfortably after all this, the prelude to this, exchanging off the dark square bishop for the knight on e3, exceptionally interesting strategically. 
if you think about it. Uh, you know, white's plans of attack have been uh, slowed down on the light squares. Black has what seems to be a nice outpost square. He didn't quite manage to exchange off the light square bishops, though. We see knight g5, maybe to go to e6. And then potentially there's dangers, even like a pawn sack on f4 would mean this queen would be liberated. So there's positional dangers now lurking with these dark squares. h4, the knight goes into e6. And yes, this, this is becoming uh, very interesting. At the moment, something like g5, there's knight takes f5 hitting the queen. So it doesn't seem as though black's king's position is crackable so easily here white plays on the queen side next with this a4 and now yes a very very interesting dynamic move b4 it seems you know the queen wants to come down this diagonal with a move like b4 now we see some dynamic potential it's a dynamic pawn sacrifice here by Mikhail Botvinnik c takes b4 knight f4 if the queen can come and take this this will be a strong pass pawn as well so this looks to be very, very interesting. What is going on here? King h1 was played. Let's have a look here. What is going on? If bishop takes, takes, takes. Black could first take on f5. And then actually play something like c3. This is exceptionally dangerous uh, in this position. Uh, and there's potential for a check here if the queen is kicked and if taking here look at this queen takes hitting both rooks is very very awkward for white it's actually winning material here um white's best might be just to give up the bishop so that can't be tolerated so this queen is is threatened uh, to be activated by this this b4 pawn sacrifice here so king h1 uh, not wanting to take here and open up this queen and now black plays g5 establishing that f4 knight black really doesn't want to take sorry white really doesn't want to take on f4 here to open up the queen uh possibly technically it seems good is also knight takes f5 and here this is this is leading to interesting positions for example like this is is interesting but um botvinnik gave white the extra pawn let white you know hold on to this extra pawn so g5, but he's got such an iron grip on the position, and he's famous for his iron grip. So the pawn sacrifice for that particular stylistic emphasis, it seems very, very logical. What is white actually doing here? Look at this bishop. It's not a picture of happiness, this bishop on d1. Look at this knight. Look at the double rooks. Black's pieces are very well coordinated. His king, in some respects, is safe for now without this constant g5 uh, nuisance threat from white. So we see b5. What about this extra pawn though? But it is doubled. a5. Pawn's not going anywhere for the moment, surely. Bishop c5. Now black took on f5, that aggressive knight taken away. King h7. And now all of a sudden, g takes and rook g8 are on the cards for black with this nicely entrenched knight on f4. Why not? Uh, it's dangerous. Very dangerous position. Uh, if we look at this, it, queen g4 was played here. If rook g1, then rook g8 is really just dangerous. Not just for, I know the, the pawn is pinned here, but now there's also g4 to undermine e4. This would be really nasty. For example, queen g4, h5. Black would be better here with g4, just undermining e4. That would be extremely horrible, this position. Uh, so, yes, this is starting to be dangerous now a bit. For white's king after this move king h7 queen g4 and botvinnik does take on h4 here threatening rook g1 sorry rook g8 so rook g1 is played stopping rook g8 h5 queen g5 and we have an exchange of queens so black hasn't got a king side uh, mating attack it seems yet and what he does now is play on the other side the queen side here this is a bit of a positional masterpiece he starts to play on the queen side rather but first knight h3 hitting the rook rook g8 yes for the moment it seems this is really really scary stuff uh it really does seem scary just the double rooks here uh we see rook a2 yes it doesn't seem 
are as though whites particularly happy in this position uh, but some indirect support for the king side here uh, with the potential b4 uh, would not only defend along the second rank potentially but also these these passed pawns would be helped if this pawn is knocked out we potentially get two passed pawns running down at black so a very interesting move looking very awkward but it seems as though yeah but it's not tempted here to double rooks um bishop b1 rook a1 bishop d3 and the rook goes back wanting this b4 move perhaps so knight f4 actually releasing the pressure from g1 and now b4 is played in this position so it is defending the second rank but in doing so white has a particular downside being created this c pawn is now a passed pawn rook c8 and this bishop now is a tactical liability as well potentially uh, you can't take here because of dropping the bishop b6 rook b7 so here a takes is a running c pawn potentially bishop e3 yes this looks pretty bad to give black a takes b4 but if he didn't retreat the bishop a takes b4 is, is happening anyway the loose bishop is exposed so and then dropping b6 is not very very pleasant uh, to allow this taking on b6 and maybe the rook coming to b1 to pin the bishop so we have bishop e3 a takes b4 and all of a sudden on the queen side here Botvinnik has got two passed pawns why of course technically has two passed pawns but which are more effective in this position we see white playing a5 so which passed pawns are more effective a very very exciting game on both sides of the board here is being conducted but black's pawn is with tempo here with b3 and if a6 i think white can't do this because of rook takes b6 so we see rook a3 b2 threats things queen immediately bishop a4 uh, c3 is played and black's pawns look quite menacing yes with c2 on the way rook b3 trying to defend against them knight e2 now knight d4 would interrupt the bishop and slow down white's pass pawns potentially uh we see here bishop b5 trying to get in potentially an exchange here for a6 because at the moment the bishop was covering a6 so bishop takes b5 rook takes and now knight d4 hitting the rook white has to respond to that he actually gives black now free connected past pawns uh, which doesn't seem like such a brilliant idea but on the other hand black is threatening c2 himself bishop takes d4 e takes d4 it seems clear that black has now what should be a fantastic asset free connected past pawns and in fact after a6 can you guess what black does here it's a logical thing to do now given the free connected past pawns what would you play here with black if i give you five seconds okay rook takes b6 just giving up a rook as long as black's not getting mated this should be a good idea the free connected past pawns <laughs> yes space invaders rook g1 but this is getting dangerous immediately isn't it d2 well it seems rook b7 might be tempting to join the rook but uh maybe just king h8 would be the safest there we see rook takes f6 instead with the idea of playing check and then rook f6 again trying to get a perpetual a draw that's parried with rook c7 not just stopping that but also the pawn here you can just take this and still defend so after rook fg6 we see now d1 queening just accelerating black's past pawns here and white resigns he can't stop the uh, past pawns f takes c2 and the past pawns are crashing through what a magnificent game strategically it's so many strategic points in this game between the two future 
world chess champions fighting it out. Black's uh, knight h7 and bishop d5 giving up the bishop for knight triggered off a lot of implications positionally. White's dark, sorry, white's light square campaign on d5 f5 slowed down. Black's outpost campaign for bishop d3 accelerated. Later, it seems Black had a dangerous initiative on the king side, but the queens came off, and it was in fact a passed pawn game on the queen side, which passed pawns were quicker on the queen side, and Botvinnik proved that his passed pawns were actually much more effective. The outpost bishop on d3 was guarding for a long time against a6 from white, so it seems white's pawns never really were as quick as black's potential passed pawns. The pawn sacrifice Botvinnik used with b4 was late, later added to with knight f4 for a second um, kind of sacrifice, which would have led to massive material loss, it seems. So b4 really triggered off a lot of dynamic potential for black's position. A fascinating game by Mikhail Botvinnik, playing you know very dynamic, aggressive chess on both sides of the board. But credit to you know, Vasily Smyslov as well. Definitely a huge talent and pr proving himself more than 10 years later when he did actually take the crown from Botvinnik but only to be wrestled back. One of Botvinnik's great strengths in the World Chess Championship matches was to be able to use the rematch clause, study his opponent's styles in great depth, find any weaknesses and you know seek revenge quite successfully. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.